was always known as the graveyard shift at any, <laughs> at any seminar program. And um, looking around, it probably was not far from the truth. But you sort of perk up as the afternoon moves on. So I thought I'd keep some interesting stuff till later on, you see. And so now we're going to move away from Europe and from the affairs of the papacy and the false prophet and to come now to some events moving in the Middle East and in particular to developments in the Gaza Strip and the rise of Hamas in that area. You know, I think as Christadelphians that would be fair to say, wouldn't it, that for us the greatest sign of the coming of Christ and of the nearness of our Lord's return is the, is the fact that the Christadelphians have seen tremendous significance in Israel coming back to their land, the most notable sign of our times, the Jewish people back in the promised land. And yet the interesting thing is that although Israel is back in their ancient land, they're clearly far from secure at this stage, aren't they? They're not safe yet. We wouldn't say that they're dwelling at peace and securely as the prophets indicate that perhaps they should. And the Palestinian threat in particular just seems to be a huge problem that won't go away. And you think, well, I don't know, I don't know what the, the answer is. So what's the biblical significance of everything that's going on in that particular area? Do you know that in 2002, five years ago, Newsweek commissioned a study of the reaction of people's views on the likely survival of Israel as a nation. The question that was asked is, do you think Israel will be here in 50 years' time? 34% uh, that Israel would remain. Of course, you realize that 34% saying that Israel will remain means that 66% thought that Israel won't survive the next 50 years. 18% specifically said that it won't survive, and 23% they thought there would be a mixed Palestinian and Jewish state in 50 years' time, but with the Palestinians in the majority. So from a biblical point of view, what do we think about what's going on in this area in terms of the latter days. Now, I had an interesting discussion in, the, in that break, and uh, this next slide might be helpful in that regard, because one of the things I think we've got to be careful of is how latter-day applications work to Bible prophecy. It's a bit tempting to look at current events and see, well, maybe this is Bible prophecy being fulfilled. The reality is that we've got to look at Bible prophecy first, and establish our credentials biblically, and then come back and see what's going on in the world and see whether it does fit or doesn't fit Bible prophecy. One of the marvelous things about Brother Thomas is that sometimes he wrote things and you looked at the world and it seemed absolutely impossible and completely inconsistent with what Brother Thomas wrote. He said, ah, but I'm driven by what the Bible says, not what it looks like right now, today. And we've got to be careful too. And one of the things we've got to be careful of is latter-day prophetic applications. Not all prophecies require or necessitate both a primary and a secondary fulfillment. And if there is to be a secondary or latter-day fulfillment, then context and comparison needs to be used to decide whether in fact that is biblically warranted or not. And if you think there is such evidence, then that latter-day application should be seen in either or both of the following. One of these you will recognize well, the other one is useful to know. Powers controlling the same territories, latter-day fulfillment, might be a different power, but on the, same, on the same territory. Or alternatively, powers manifesting the same attributes. It could be a prophecy being fulfilled by a latter-day application where some thing or some power in the world today is showing the same characteristics of behavior. And then again, I think there are some prophecies that appear to have had no previous fulfillment at all, and it leads to the conclusion that the primary and only consummation lies still ahead in the latter days. There doesn't appear to have been any previous fulfillment in history. So we've got to be careful how we move ahead with Bible prophecy. Now, having said that, we're going to try and make sense of what's going on in Israel today, and particularly with the Palestinians, but we're going to do so from a clear line of biblical argument, which is what, of course, we should always do. Palestine and Palestinians. Well, it's a biblical term, actually, because the word Palestinian comes from the word Palestina that's found in the Bible. 
It's the Hebrew word peleseth. And that word peleseth, meaning rolling or migratory, hence the land of the wanderers, is translated as Palestina three times, as Palestine once, as Philistia three times, and as Philistines once. But it's the word translated Palestina. It's where the word Palestine comes from and where the word Palestinian is derived from. So there is a biblical basis to this particular word. So I guess what we would say is that from a scriptural perspective, therefore, a Palestinian is a Philistine, and a Philistine is a Palestinian, because certainly they control the same territory, the Palestinians compared to the Philistines of old. They manifest the same attributes, so they qualify on both counts, and they're going to receive or share the same end from a biblical perspective. In fact, interestingly enough, the Arabic for the term Palestine liberation is Tahriya Philistine. So you can see that interplay between the word Philistine, Philistine, and Palestine, Palestinian. It's all one word in the Hebrew. So there's a biblical background to that particular word. Now, I should really cover my position at the outset, in case you think I'm heading off in the wrong direction biblically, and just say this. Modern Palestinians are not in any way descended from the actual Philistines of Old Testament times. There's no actual connection with the Philistines. There's no ethnic or linguistic or cultural connection whatsoever. The Philistines are gone brothers and sisters, they were exterminated off the face of the earth, as we shall see in a set of prophecies that we're going to look at later on. In fact, I'd have to say that the whole story of the Palestinian people today is the most amazing media fraud perpetrated by the Palestinian people themselves. It's been a very successful fraud. You see, there were Arabs living in Mandate Palestine at the time of Israel's independence. There were lots of them. And some of, those, some, of those, um, some of those people, by the way, had lived there for several generations. There's absolutely no doubt about that. There were Arab nations or Arab families living in Arab villages in Mandate Palestine that had been there for generations. And yes, some of them were dispossessed in the 1948 War of Independence. But a lot of the Arabs that were in Palestine at the time that Israel came into existence had actually come from other places. And the reason is because when the Jews arrived, they were industrious, they began business, they began commerce. There was economic activity, and what happened is Arabs came from other lands because of Jewish, common, because of Jewish commerce and employment. They came into that region from other Arab nations. In fact, you know that from the year, uh, sorry, up until the year 1948, the word Palestinian always referred to a Jew living in Palestine, not to an Arab, up until the year 1948. The word Palestinian always referred to a Jewish person living in Palestine, not an Arab. It's only a real, relatively modern phenomena that the word Palestinian is even applied to, in fact, Arab people. Now, let me tell you something interesting that happened at the time of the War of Independence in Israel. See, what happened is there were all these refugees, all these Palestinian refugees, by the way, there was about 600,000 of them. And you'd never guess how many Jewish refugees came from the surrounding Arab lands into Israel at the time that 600,000 Arab refugees fled out into those same Arab lands. Why? About 600,000 Jewish refugees who fled from Arab lands into Israel. And 600,000 Arab refugees fled out of Israel. I think they're about quits, really, aren't they? And yet the Palestinians claim the right of return back to Palestine at any time. But guess what? If any of the Jews that had fled as refugees from Arab nations, if they went back there and said, we'd like our land back, our factory, our property, our bank account, our jewellery, our paintings, our businesses, do you think they'd be reinstated back in the Arab lands that they fled from where it was all confiscated when they left? Not likely. But apparently, the Palestinians demand the right of return at all times to Palestine. Because, of course, what happened in the 1948 war was that the Jewish radio broadcast messages to all the Arab villages saying, don't leave, don't leave. We want to, to, to live together in peace. But the Arab radio said, get out, get out now. We're going to destroy them. We're going to wipe them off the face of the earth. Go away for a week or two and it'll all be over. And so they left. And unfortunately, the Arabs didn't win. Israel won. And so there were people stranded, you see. War's never an easy thing. 
fact, let me tell you how silly it was. When the United Nations, that august assembly of important people, came into Palestine to sort out the problem, to deal with the poor Palestinian refugees, they had to decide on, well, what do we define a, Jewish, uh, sorry, a Palestinian Arab refugee as? So they said, well, um, well, you've got to have lived in Palestine for at least 24 months. So now we had Arabs who'd come from Tunisia and from Morocco and from Syria and Iraq who'd been in Palestine for all of five years who are now cruelly torn from their ancient homeland where they've lived for all of five years because they're a Palestinian refugee. See, the whole thing was a fraud. There's no Palestinian language, there's no Palestinian culture, there's no Palestinian identity. They were simply Arabs living in the region. And let me tell you something else interesting. That from 1948 to 1967, guess who controlled the West Bank and the city of Jerusalem? Brutally occupied. Why? The country of Jordan. Not the Jewish people. Israel didn't control the West Bank and the city of Jerusalem, Jordan did. And yet the strange thing is, from 1948 to 1967, as during those years of Jordanian occupation, not one single Palestinian group ever put their hand up and said, we want to go back to our homeland, it's ours. The funny thing is, they only discovered that they were Palestinians once Israel took control of that same territory. Funny, isn't it, how things work? It was a fraud, brothers and sisters. And we need to understand that. So come to the book of, come to the book of Exodus and let's start with some biblical analysis, shall we, of the Palestinian problem from a Bible perspective and see if we can get our bearings on what we might expect to develop from here on out. Well, we're told this in Exodus chapter 15. It says in verse 13 of Exodus chapter 15. This is at the time of Israel coming up out of the wilderness towards the promised land. The record says, Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. The people shall hear and be afraid. Sorrow shall take hold on the inhabitants of Palestina. Then the dukes of Edom shall be amazed. The mighty men of Moab trembling shall take hold upon them. All the inhabitants of Canaan shall melt away. Fear and dread shall fall upon them by the greatness of thine arm. They shall be as still as a stone till thy people pass over, O Lord, till the people pass over which thou hast purchased. And what Exodus 15 is talking about, brothers and sisters, is that as Israel marched towards the promised land, the nations that inhabited this particular land trembled at the news of Israel on the march because that land there had been promised to the Jews and there were other people living there. And in fact, if we're to come from the bottom up, from verse 15, do you notice that we probably have an indication of where they were, these particular powers? It says, all the inhabitants of Canaan shall melt away, but Canaan was really in the center of the land. And then going back up, it says, The mighty men of Moab, trembling, shall take hold upon them. But Moab was really to the east. And then it says, The dukes of Edom shall be amazed. But Edom was to the south. So it's not difficult to postulate where Palestina might be in verse 14, is it? And you're quite right, it's to the west. Palestina was on the west. And in fact, we know that because from the biblical point of view, what we're told is this, in terms of Palestina in Old Testament times, is that there was a passage in the, in the book of Joshua that says all the borders of the Philistines, the Palestinians, the five lords of the Philistines, the Gazathites and the Ashtothites and the Eshkelonites, and the Gittites and the Ekronites. So here are the five cities of the lords of the Philistines, and those five cities made up the territory that was known in Old Testament times as Palestina. It was on the west, on the coastal strip 
that's where it was in biblical times. And although that part of the land was expressly promised to Israel, brothers and sisters, they never managed to conquer it, not completely, not totally. They never managed to conquer the Philistines, who remained as a pricking briar or a piercing thorn in Israel's side. And they were, they were always at odds with Israel. In fact, Israel only enjoyed times of peace when the Palestinians were defeated. But they never had the faith to do the job properly. And so from the time of Joshua, at the time of the entering into the land, that particular region, the region of Palestina, was a region of constant controversy with Israel. Now, let me show you two Bible illustrations of that to show you that enmity at work between Israel and the Palestinians of Old Testament times. Now, you need two hands for this. How fortunate, isn't it, that you've got two of them? So, in your right hand, you need Psalm 108, a Psalm of David. So, Psalm 108 in your right hand, and with your left hand, you need the First of Chronicles chapter 18. So, Psalm 108 and First of Chronicles 18. So here it is. Now, Psalm 108 is a psalm of David, and it's spoken at a particular time, because verse 7 says, a special time, God has spoken in his holiness. Now, by the way, I think that when Psalm 108, verse 6, 7 says, God hath spoken in his holiness, I think that's a reference to the great promise of of the second of Samuel chapter 7, the great covenant promise made to David. Because do you remember in that promise, God promised that I will give to David, I will give thee rest from all thine enemies round about thee. And David goes out as a result of that promise, and he does battle with the kingdoms around him, and he subdues them. This is what Psalm 108 says, verse 7. God had spoken in his holiness, I will rejoice, I will divide Shechem and meet out the valley of Succoth, Gilead is mine, Manasseh is mine, Ephraim is the strength of my head, Judah is my lawgiver, Moab is my washpot, over Edom will I cast out my shoe, over Palestina, because that's our key word in the Hebrew, over Palestina will I triumph, says David. And so he promises himself in this psalm that on the strength of the divine promise, he will go forth and subdue that very area. Well, that's exactly what 1 Chronicles 18 in your other hand says. Immediately after receiving that promise, it says in the 1 Chronicles 18 and verse 1, Now after this it came to pass that David smote the Philistines and subdued them and took Gath and her towns out of the hand of the Philistines. He said that he would triumph over Palestina. And so he did, brothers and sisters. He went forth and he warred against that area and brought them into subjection so that Israel might have peace. That was the only way, only way they could obtain peace at that time. Now, here's a second illustration, and now we've come from the time of David a long way forward to the time of good King Hezekiah of Judah. So now this time, in your right hand, you need Isaiah chapter 14, and right at the end of the chapter, towards the end of the chapter, and in your left hand, you need the second of Kings and chapter 18, at the start of the chapter. So second Kings 18 at the start of the chapter, but Isaiah 14 in your right hand towards the end of the chapter. So now we've come forward from David's time several hundred years, many generations of kings. Do you think the spirit of Palestina has changed? Do you think life's got any easier for Israel with regard to the Palestinians? And the answer will have a look at this. Isaiah 14 in verse 28. It says, in the year that King Ahaz died was this burden. And by the way, I think the burden of Isaiah 14 verse 28 is the words that's going to come, the words that will follow in verses 29 to 32. That's the burden. In the year that King Ahaz died was this burden. Here it is. Rejoice not thou, verse 29, whole Palestina, because the rod of him that smote thee is broken. King Ahaz is dead. For out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice, Hezekiah his son, and his fruit shall be a fiery flying serpent. And the firstborn of the poor shall feed, and the needy shall lie down in safety. But I will kill thy root with famine, and he, he shall slay thy remnant. 
Howl, O gate, cry, O city, thou whole Palestina art dissolved. For this will come from the north a smoke, and none shall be alone in his appointed times. What shall one then answer the messengers of the nation? That the Lord hath founded Zion, and the poor of his people shall trust in it. And when King Ahaz died, in effect the prophecy was, if that the Palestinians were expecting some respite because of the death of Ahaz, they would be disappointed. Because Ahaz's son... King Hezekiah would come forth and smite them with the same vigor as his father had done. Do you know that's exactly what happened? Because look at this. 2 Kings 18 in your left hand, verse 1. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. So that's the beginning of the reign of Hezekiah. When do you think Hezekiah started his reign, brothers and sisters? What year? Well, probably in the, in the year that his father died, I suppose. In the year that his father died. Ah, Isaiah 14. In the year that King Ahaz died was this burden. That's the very year that Hezekiah comes to power, isn't it? And you see what it says concerning Hezekiah, verse 7 of 2 Kings 18. And Yahweh was with him, and he prospered whithersoever he went forth, and he rebelled against the king of Assyria, and served him not, and he smote the Philistines, even unto Gaza, and the borders thereof, from the tower of the watchman to the fenced city. And he did exactly what the burden of Isaiah chapter 14 declared he would do, and he became a power of judgment against the Palestinians in his day. And these kings, David and Hezekiah, warred against Palestina because, well, one never had respite unless one could bring that area into subjugation. In fact, finally, brothers and sisters, what happened from a, a biblical point of view is that God decreed judgment upon Palestina because of their spirit of unrelenting hostility towards Israel. Do you remember the great promise of Genesis 12? I will bless him that blesseth thee, and I will curse him that curseth thee. And Palestina never stopped cursing Israel till God finally said, enough. And he uttered prophecies of judgment against Palestina. There was one in Amos chapter 1 that was fulfilled by Pharaoh Necho of Egypt. There was another one in Jeremiah chapter 47, which was also fulfilled by Pharaoh Necho of Egypt. There would be one in Ezekiel 25, which would be fulfilled by Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. There was one in Zechariah chapter 9 that was fulfilled by Alexander of Greece. And finally, there was one in Zephaniah chapter 2, which was filled by, fulfilled by Judas Maccabeus of Israel. And uh, as a result of those judgments, brothers and sisters, by the time all of those judgments, judgments were fulfilled, the Philistines were gone from the face of the earth in their entirety. They had disappeared. They'd been exterminated by the judgments of God. And by the way, I'm not sure, I'm not at all convinced that any of those prophecies need a latter-day fulfillment. See, they've been fulfilled. You can't just take a prophecy and think, well, maybe it'll happen again. Not unless there's sound Bible evidence that it's going to happen again. These prophecies have been fulfilled and the Philistines were destroyed as a result of those prophecies of judgment. Ah, but that's not the question, really. The burning question for today is, well, if Israel is back in the land again at the time of the end in fulfillment of Bible prophecy... Do we expect to see a Jewish-Palestinian conflict as well again at the time of the end in fulfillment of Bible prophecy? In other words, do we expect to see a revival not only of Israel but also of Palestina at the time of the end and a resumption of the hostility that was shown to them and between them in biblical times? And the answer is, yes, I think probably so. So let's have a look at that, shall we, in terms of some of the Bible evidence that might suggest this, that possibly we're going to have Palestina revived upon its ancient territory. Well, let's have a look at some of these passages as we go. I'm going to say a little bit about each of them. The first one is this, Psalm 83, verses 6 to 7. Actually, we might turn Psalm 83 up, because probably quite an important little passage. 
in Psalm 83, we've got a prophecy about clearly a confederacy that comes against Israel. Now, by the way, I'm quite sure that it had an historical background. I'm going to come to that in a minute. The question is, is there evidence for a latter-day application of the psalm? So remember what we've said. We've got to prove it. You can't just assume it. You've got to prove that there might be a latter-day application. Now, what's interesting about Psalm 83, brothers and sisters, is that this psalm is sometimes taken, again within the Christadelphian community, under an alternative prophetical view, as evidence that a Jewish Arab conflict is the cause celebre of latter day Bible prophecy. It's the great issue of the time of the end. A Jewish Arab controversy, proof Psalm 83. And there's ten nations in Psalm 83 which are in turn linked to the ten toes of Daniel 2 to suggest that this is the final great stage, this is the battle, and that that battle, by the way, will result in a terrible and total defeat for Israel. Well, I think before we rush into making that conclusion, we perhaps need to have a wee look at the historical background to the psalm, because I think there was one, and you might change your view of the psalm once you know the background. So again, just hold your hand in Psalm 83 and come back to the second of Chronicles chapter 20. Actually, this is one of the psalms of the house of Asaph. Now, some of you will know the house of Asaph uttered psalms throughout their various family generations over quite a long period of Israelitish history. So we've got to try and establish when this particular psalm was uttered by the house of Asaph because they uttered many psalms and at different times of the history of the nation. So where does this psalm fit? Well, you've got both of those, 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Sorry, first of, actually it is, 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Did I say first? I should have said second. So 2 Chronicles 20 and Psalm 83. Now, you see what it says in verse 5 of the psalm. It says, They've consulted together with one consent because they are confederate against thee. So it was a confederacy. So it was a great number that came against Israel, according to Psalm 83. A confederacy of nations, no less. Well, by the way, that's exactly what Chronicles says. Because you see what it says. 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 2. There came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee. And again, we're told in verse 12, in Jehoshaphat's prayer, he says, O our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. And again, in verse 15, in the middle of the verse, Thus saith Yahweh unto you, be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude. So there was a great multitude, says Chronicles, and there was a great confederacy, says Psalm 83. But the question is, who were the ringleaders? Who was leading the drive of this confederacy on this occasion? Well, Psalm 83 tells us who were the leaders. Because you see what it says in Psalm 83, at the end of the list of people, verse 8, at the end of the list it says, These all, they have holpen the children of Lot. Ah, so the ring leaders of the confederacy in Psalm 83 were the children of Lot. Question, who were the children of Lot? Can anyone remember? Moab and Ammon. You see what the second of Chronicles, chapter 20, says? Second Chronicles 20, verse 1. And it came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon and with them other beside. Ah, so there's a confederacy, but it's led by the children of Moab and the children of Ammon, who just happen to be the children of Lot, which is what Psalm 83 says. And again in verse 10 of 2 Chronicles 20, it says, And now behold, the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir. And again, it's going to say in, uh, in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 22 is going to say, And when they began to sing and to praise, it says that the Lord said ambushments against the children of Ammon and Moab. Verse 23, For the children of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir. So Moab and Ammon were the ringleaders of this particular confederacy, that's the children of Lot. And by the way, in Psalm 83, if you've still got it, you see what it says in verse 12? They said, did these who came, let us take to ourselves 
the houses of God in possession. And the margin itself says, why, well, see 2 Chronicles 20, verse 11, and the prayer of Jehoshaphat, which says, Behold, I say, how they reward us to come, to cast us out of thy possession, which thou hast given us to inherit. And the spirit of the psalm is echoed in the prayer of Jehoshaphat at this time of crisis. And lastly, do you see how the psalm finishes? Psalm 83, verse 18. He says, maybe verse 17 for connection. Let them be confounded and troubled forever. Yea, let them be put to shame and perish, that men may know that thou whose name alone is Yahweh art the most high in all the earth. And the psalmist cried for a victory on that day, that everyone might know amongst the nations how great the God of Israel is. Now, do you know what happened in the second of Chronicles? Well, of course, you know what happened. They put the singers in front, didn't they? they put the singers in front of the army, and they marched off to battle with the singers at the front. And when they got to the battlefield... There was no need for a battle because God had already destroyed the hosts of the enemies. Do you remember that? But you see what Chronicles says. Second Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 27 says, They returned, every man of Judah and Jerusalem and Jehoshaphat in the forefront of them to go again to Jerusalem with joy for, for Yahweh had made them to rejoice over their enemies. And they came to Jerusalem with psalteries and harps and trumpets unto the house of Yahweh. And the fear of God was on all the kingdoms of those countries when they heard that Yahweh fought against the enemies of Israel. And the psalmist had said, let them be put to shame that men may know that thou whose name art Yahweh art the most high over all the earth. And Chronicle says that the nations feared when they heard that the God of Israel had fought against their enemies. That's the very fulfillment of the psalm. Is it not, brothers and sisters? I think so. There is an historical background to Psalm 83. So by the way, it's already been fulfilled in the days of Jehoshaphat. So before we leap into a conclusion that this is a latter-day psalm, we would need other evidence that necessarily it might have a latter-day application. And by the way, even if it did, even if Psalm 83 did have a latter-day application, what would it suggest to us? I think it would suggest two things. Firstly, that there could be Arab-Israeli conflict at the time of the end, and that it could include Palestina, because that's what Psalm 83 verse 7 says. The word Philistines is actually the word Palestina. But that doesn't of itself establish that the Jewish Arab conflict is the great contest of the time of the end, simply that there is some controversy again. And in one particular detail, I think what this psalm suggests is the very opposite of the reason for which it's pressed into service. Because the alternative view uses Psalm 83 to prove a devastating, shocking, terrible war that Israel loses and the Arabs win. But I think that Psalm 83, if it proves anything at all, is not a catastrophic defeat of Israel by Palestine. But based on the historical background in the days of Jehoshaphat, wouldn't it imply a brilliant victory for Israel? And that is much more in keeping with our expectation in terms of another Arab-Israeli war. Oh, and you notice the connection on the screen there, not just with Palestina, but with the inhabitants of Tyre. Now, where's Tyre? Well, it's up the road in Lebanon. So guess who's in Tyre at the moment? Who's running things in the southern part of Lebanon? And the answer is Hezbollah, being funded by the Syrians, which in turn are being funded by the Iranians. We'll come back to that in a minute. And so just notice the connection that the hostility that Palestina shows is linked to the inhabitants of Tyre. So let's turn up another passage then, shall we, which is the book of Obadiah. Well, Obadiah is another one of those, it's a tricky little book to find, really, Obadiah, isn't it? If you, um, you know, one of those things you've got to really hunt it down. If you've got to Amos, you haven't gone far enough. If you reach the book of Jonah, you've overshot. So the book of Obadiah, given its brevity, but do you notice what Obadiah says in... Um, Obadiah, verses 19 and 20. Verse 17 for connection. By the way, this clearly does presumably come to the time of the end finally because it says in verse 17, Upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance and there shall be holiness and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. 
Verse 21 says that saviors will come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. So that's reaching forward, isn't it? The kingdom shall be the Lord's. And if there is a fulfillment at the time of the end, it says this in verse 19, they of the south shall possess the Mount of Esau and they of the plain shall possess the Palestinians. The coastal plain, by the way, where the, Philistine, where the Philistines were of Old Testament times. And not only that, but they shall possess the fields of Ephraim and the fields of Samaria, and Benjamin shall possess Gilead. And it says in verse 20, in the captivity of this host of the children of Israel shall possess that of the Canaanites, even unto Zarephath. Ah, now where's Zarephath? And the answer is, Zarephath's in Lebanon, in between Tyre and Sidon. That's the very place mentioned or associated with Palestina in Psalm 83. There's those hostile to Israel in Palestina, and there's those hostile to Israel in the inhabitants of Tyre. And in the future, it says that Israel will possess the territory of the Philistines, the plain of the Philistines, and they'll also possess the region of Zarephath, which is the period or the area of Tyre. Well, let's come to another one, because you might think, well, yes, they're interesting. But, but I don't know that I'd be completely convinced that that's necessarily latter day. What about this one? Joel chapter 3. Now Joel 3, we go backwards for, don't we, at least from Obadiah. And in Joel 3 we do have a chapter that clearly has been given a latter day application by the Christadelphian community down through time because we believe that this is a prophecy of the final threshing in the land, the battle of Armageddon, when the sheaves are judged. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of threshing, this chapter will go on to say. And, and the context is, chapter 3 verse 1, Behold, in those days and at that time when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. So we give a latter day application, don't we, to Joel 3 at the time of the end. When the great confederacy comes down against Israel in the land, back in the land. And yet the strange thing about that is that in the middle of all that, verse 4 says, Yea, and what have ye to do with me, O Tyre and Zidon, and all the coasts of Palestina, that's our Hebrew word, will ye render me a recompense? And if ye recompense me, swiftly and speedily will I return your recompense upon your own head. And clearly what we're being told is that the recompense of God shall be upon the coast of Palestina in recompense for some evil that they have given to God. And presumably, God's judgments can only be outworked in the fulfillment of Joel 3 verse 4 if there are Palestinians in Palestina upon whom the recompense can be visited, don't you think? Otherwise, there's no basis for the fulfillment of the prophecy at the time of the end. And notice how particularly Palestine is addressed. It's quite interesting. How is Palestina addressed? It's not just Palestina. It's the coasts of Palestina. There's something fishy about this, brothers and sisters. Something very fishy about this. And Tyre and Sidon again, up the coast, the coastal cities of Lebanon. We've got the smell of the sea here somewhere. I can sniff it. <laughs> And that smell of the sea in these verses and the significance of that seaside air is going to, well, it'll become apparent by and by as our story of Palestina unfolds. And now one last reference. Come and have a look at Isaiah chapter 11. Now, Isaiah 11 is clearly set in the future because we're told in Isaiah 11 that this is the time when the great end sign shall be established upon the land of Israel once again. And the end sign is related to the root of Jesse. It's the return of our Lord Jesus Christ to the earth. The planting of the end sign, verse 10, which shall stand as an end sign for the people, and to it shall the Gentiles seek. And verse 11 of Isaiah 11 says, It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people going to be a time of the reconciliation of the Jewish nation. In fact, verse 13 goes on to say, The envy of Ephraim shall depart, the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off, Ephraim shall not envy Judah, Judah shall not vex Ephraim, they'll all be reconciled. But what they will do, it says, verse 14, 
is that they shall fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines toward the west. Ah, now that's interesting, isn't it? And presumably, brothers and sisters, Israel in that day, when they return at the time of the ensign, presumably they can only fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines to the west. If there is a Palestina to the west, to fly upon. So I think that the cumulative weight of these four passages would certainly suggest to us that a revival of Palestina upon her ancient territory is very likely at the time of the end. In fact, one of the interesting things about the Oslo Peace Accords is that it nominated Gaza as the provisional capital for any proposed Palestinian state that might emerge. Proposed Gaza as the potential capital. Gaza. I mean, just think about it, brothers and sisters. That's one of the very names of the five cities of the lords of the Philistines. And where's modern Palestina? Right smack where it used to be, under the same name. The Gaza Strip, one of the cities of the five lords of the Philistines. And the spirit of Latter-day Palestina is an exact duplicate of the spirit of Palestina in the past. Because here it is. This is one of those prophecies of judgment that we mentioned earlier on, but didn't look at. But, well, we'll just look at one of them in terms of the spirit of, uh, of what it is. Palestina and that spirit of continuous hatred towards Israel. See, what it says in Ezekiel 25 is that the Philistines of old were destroyed by God because, it says, they have dealt by revenge and have taken vengeance with a despiteful heart to destroy with the perpetual hatred. Actually, in the authorised version it says that they've taken vengeance with a despiteful heart to destroy it for the old hatred. But the word old is the word olam. It's that hatred which is forever. It's the perpetual. It's the endless. It's the relentless hatred. And in fact, what's interesting about that prophecy in Ezekiel chapter 25 is it goes on to say, I will stretch out mine hand upon the Philistines, and I will cut off the Kerithim, and I will destroy the remnant of the sea coast, it says, against the Philistines in Ezekiel 25. Now, now what's interesting about that spirit, brothers and sisters, is this. You see, really, if you think about that, that's the spirit of Hamas today, isn't it? Don't you think? They've dealt by revenge and have taken vengeance with a despiteful heart to destroy with the old, perpetual, relentless hatred. That's Hamas. Now, I want you to think about this amazing sweep of events that has recently brought us to this particular moment of time. And by the way, in view of what I said earlier on about being careful about not trying to fit current events into Bible prophecy, could I just mention that the first time I ever gave a lecture on this was about uh, eight years ago, long before there'd been any move on movements in the Gaza Strip. So we're not being driven by current events. We're being driven by a biblical line of argument here. But think about the current events now in the light of what we've seen. See, what Israel decided to do was to rel relinquish control of the Gaza Strip. So they withdrew all the Israelis. Do you remember there was about 8,000 of them? Do you remember the Gush Katif region? They drew all these Israelis out and they offered to resettle them elsewhere. And one last settlement held out to the bitter end and the soldiers had to go in and, and literally drag them out one by one. It was the settlement of Netzarim on the coast, the last of all the Jewish settlements to leave. But finally they'd gone, all of them. They removed all the military personnel and they handed over responsibility to the PLO to govern Gaza. Now you stop and think about it. This was in the days of Ariel Sharon. Ariel Sharon was an old battle warrior. Why would Sharon have given up the Gaza Strip, warrior that he was? Well, I think he was playing a game of political brinksmanship with the world at that time. And I think what he did was this. You see, there was pressure to negotiate on the West Bank, releasing the West Bank to Palestinian control. I think what Sharon did to test the world, to show the world that the Jews can do business, is he said, well, let's give them the Gaza Strip to start with, shall we? We'll hand it over, we'll withdraw in full, and we'll allow them to develop and control the Gaza Strip as a Palestine national entity, a Palestinian state. And let's see how they go. 
And if that all sorts out well and, and we live in peace and amity side by side, then we can talk about the West Bank in due course. And of course, Sharon knew. Sharon knew the spirit of Ishmael. He knew the words of Genesis. And he shall be a wild man. Every man's hand shall be against him and his hand shall be against every man. He knew. He knew what the Arabs would be like in that region. And of course, what happened was that he expected that they would carry on being hostile to Israel, carry on bombing Israel, and he would be able to say to all the world, well, look, we tried, we gave them the Gaza Strip, but it hasn't solved anything, so we can't possibly talk about the West Bank at this stage. And he would have bought some peace and some time for Israel. But there was one thing that Sharon didn't bank on, apart from a stroke, of course, and that was this that there was a PLO election and it brought a dramatic result because to the surprise even of the Palestinians Hamas was elected to government and not Fatah and what's interesting about that is Hamas is committed absolutely to the old battle cry of the Palestinians no peace with Israel no recognition of Israel no negotiation of Israel Hamas has an openly stated policy that they are there to destroy Israel quite openly not ashamed of saying that that's what they believe and what happened, of course, as a result of that, was we ended up in that particular region with a brutal internal battle for the control, not of the West Bank notice, but of the Gaza Strip, which ended up with the complete rout of Fatah out of that whole area. And Hamas has just recently taken control of the whole of the Gaza Strip, absolutely and totally, controls it completely at this stage. So much so that news agencies are already referring to the West Bank as Fatah land and Gaza Strip as Hamazistan to signal the change that's occurred. And so now we've got a split within the Palestinians into two different blocks and two different pieces of land. And, and you know what happened? On the day that Hamas took complete control of Gaza, Israel declared the Gaza Strip to be, quote, a hostile entity, unquote. That sounds to me like David and Hezekiah of old, that the Palestinians were on their doorstep and they regarded them as hostile. So the question is, who's funding Hamas? How come Hamas was able to do all of this? Well, the money flows through Syria, as someone rightly said, but it comes from Iran. And that same channel supports and equips Hezbollah in Lebanon, or, or should I say Tyre and Sidon? Now, what's interesting about that is this. Iran is Shiite, not Sunni Islam. Now, why that's significant, brothers and sisters, is this. That Shiite doctrine is not the same as Sunni Muslim doctrine. Because what the Shiites believe is that the successes of those who came from Muhammad ended up in what was called the mysterious 12th Imam. And the 12th Imam is known as the Hidden One. He's going to reappear at one particular stage in the history of the world. And when he reappears, there's going to be a marvelous renaissance of the Arab nation. The 12th Imam, the Shiites, are waiting for him. But guess what? Shiite teaching says that when the 12th Imam appears, it will be at the time that Israel is destroyed. Shiites believe that. Sunnis don't. Sunnis have a different view about the successor from Muhammad. That's not their doctrine. It is Shiite doctrine. So the Shiites are doctrinally committed to the destruction of Israel. And they're funding Hezbollah in Tyre and Sidon, and they are funding Hamas in Gaza in order that they might set up in those two places two Islamic enclaves, but guess what? They'll be Shiite enclaves, not Sunni enclaves, and they're driven by the same doctrinal imperative to destroy Israel. That's remarkable what's actually going on at this particular point of time, and exactly what we would expect prophetically and certainly Israel now knows the value of any peace accord signed with the PLO, which is, of course, that it's absolutely worthless. Of course, they would have known that if they'd read their Bibles, because what the Bible says about that is this. If you look at the Bible's poems on Palestina, they were all poems of conquest and not poems of peace. The Bible had said that the, that the inhabitants of Palestina would have sorrow take hold of them because Israel was coming to possess the land. 
Psalm 108, remember, said, over Palestina will I triumph because David was going to conquer them. Isaiah 14 said that Palestina would howl because Hezekiah would come and smite them. The Bible never suggested peace treaties with the Palestinians, quite the reverse. In fact, let me show you that in terms of what the Bible says. I think the Bible made it absolutely clear that there was only ever safety for Israel when Palestina was subdued. So look at this little run of quotations that I think helps to establish that. Chronicle says, David smote the Philistines and subdued them and took Gath and her towns out of the hand of the Philistines. First of Kings 4 says, Solomon reigned over all the kingdoms unto the land of the Philistines, for he had dominion unto Gaza. Second Chronicle 17 says, and the fear of the Lord fell upon all the kingdoms and the Philistines, the Palestinians, brought Jehoshaphat tribute. Again, we're going to be told that in the days of, of Uzziah the king, it says that he went forth and warred against the Palestinians and built cities about Ashdod and among the Philistines. Which, by the way, tells us that the Jewish practice of building cities or settlements in occupied territory is not a new one. That Uzziah was doing that many years ago. Building settlements in occupied territory. And of the, of the time of Hezekiah, it says, as we've seen before, he, Hezekiah, smote the Philistines even unto Gaza. See all those key words? David warred. Solomon had dominion. Jehoshaphat received tribute. Isaiah went forth and warred against them. Hezekiah smote the Philistines. Now what's interesting is that all those kings of Judah had alliances, political alliances with other nations, but none of them ever, ever negotiated a peace treaty with Palestina because peace only came when that area was under military subjection. Have you ever stopped to ask yourself this question, brothers and sisters, as to how the peace and safety of Ezekiel 38 might come about? I give you two options. A peaceful negotiation with Hamas, signed in the spirit of brotherly friendship, or another military confrontation that the Jews win on the basis of Psalm 83. I think if Psalm 83 is an indicator, it would suggest perhaps the latter, wouldn't it? Triggered by some dramatic event. We don't know what it might be. I don't know, by the way, whether that is what will happen, but it's a possibility. And that there will be an Israeli reprisal after the manner of, of David and Solomon and Jehoshaphat and Isaiah and Hezekiah of old. A rout of opposing forces. And that Israel may take control of the West Bank absolutely, which biblically she must be in control of at the time of the end. And put a ring of steel around Gaza to contain the spirit of hatred that broods and festers in that place. And I believe, brothers and sisters, that if Israel does that at some stage in the future, she will have set the scene for the invasion of Gog, who's the latter-day Assyro-Babylonian. Now, actually, there's a really good point that I want to make here. So if you've been sleeping throughout the course of this particular address, now's the time to wake up and pay attention for this last crucial few moments. Now, here's the great lesson. What's the great... Let me see if I can just put that... that well, that's much better. Now I've really got your attention. What was the greatest calamity of Israel in Old Testament times? Answer, when the Babylonians came down and overthrew the nation and led them off into captivity. Question, were there some surrounding Arab nations that threw in their lot with Nebuchadnezzar when he came down to be hostile to Israel? Yes. Were they the main story? No. What was the main story? Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon. When Rome came down with Titus or Vespasian and Titus and marched against Israel, were there some surrounding nations that threw in their lot with the Romans to settle old scores against Israel? Yes. Were they the main story? No. What was the main story? Rome. Babylon. When Gog comes down at the time of the end, might there be some Arab nations associated with Gog in her invasion? Yes. Are they the main story? No. What's the main story? Gog, latter-day Babylon. See, it's a question of understanding the framework of Bible prophecy. I think that what these prophecies indicate to us is that there's every likelihood of further Jewish-Arab controversy, but that's not the same as saying that it's the great controversy at the time of the end. In fact, brothers and sisters, let me show you what I think is exactly going to happen when Gog comes into the land, because I think it's actually extremely interesting concerning Palestina. Now look at this. 
you remember what it says in Zechariah? It says that when Gog comes into the land, when the great invasion comes into the land at the time of the end, and Gog, by the way, is simply part of the Babylonish thing at the time of the end. It's all Babylon. It's the military part of Babylon, but it's Babylon. When Gog comes down, we're told in Zechariah 14, assuming, of course, that Zechariah 14 and Joel 3 and Daniel 11 and Ezekiel 38 are all synchronous and simultaneous prophecies, which I believe they are, it says in Zechariah that half the city will go forth into captivity. That actually means that Jewish people will be deported out of the land, brothers and sisters. That's what it's saying, sent forth into captivity. And by the way, um, if we were to say, well, where from? Well, isn't that what Joel said? Yea, and what have ye to do with me, O Tyre and Zidon, and all the coasts of Palestina, the children of Judah, have ye sold unto the Grecians? And I think that when Gog comes down and is going to lead forth Jewish people into captivity and says, well, what will we do? The Palestinians will put up their hand and say, we've got some pretty good coastline here. Would you like to use our ships? Ship them off from here. And I think that's exactly what Joel chapter 3 is suggesting, brothers and sisters. And why that's so is, have a look what Isaiah says. Isaiah says something very strange. Do you know what Brother Thomas said? In fact, let me take that off for a minute. Brother Thomas says, can I get that to go off? Yes, I can. Brother Thomas said that those Jews back in the land at the time of Christ's return are prophetically styled Judah. And those Jews still in the world waiting to be regathered are prophetically styled Israel. Judah's back in the land because the Bible says that God will save the tents of Judah first. That's got to be the Jews back in the land at the time that Christ comes. But the house of Israel is yet to be regathered, scattered in all corners of the earth. But the funny thing about Isaiah 11, it says that he shall gather the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah. Question, how come this dispersed of Judah after Christ has returned as the end sign in Isaiah chapter 11? And the answer is because some of them have been sent in captivity when Gog comes down. And you notice the very first thing they do when they come back into the land, it says they fly upon the shoulders of the Palestinians. I wonder why they might do that, brothers and sisters. Unless it's in reprisal for the fact that these are the ones that sold them into captivity, don't you think? At the time of the end. Let's ship them off here, says Palestina. I think what the Bible's saying is that Palestina will be Gog's ally in Jewish deportations at the time of the end. So just one more interesting thing about that then in terms of signs of the times is there was an interesting article, you know, in the Christadelphian magazine about two years ago, I think it was 2005. You see that little red dot underneath Gaza, by the way? See Gaza, the black dot on the coast? Can your eagle eyes spot the red dot underneath that? Splendid. This was the article in the Signs of the Times, the Christadelphian. An agreement has been reached to allow the Palestinians to rebuild their port just south of Gaza City, not far from where the settlement of Netzarim once stood. That was the last settlement to withdraw at the time of the Israeli withdrawal from Gaza. That's the very place where the Palestinians intend to build their port, the old site of the last Jewish settlement of modern times. The port is being seen as a symbol of Palestinian independence and as their economic gateway to the world, and we might add, and as the shipping port for Jewish captives when Gog comes down. Isn't it interesting how Bible prophecy is fulfilled, brothers and sisters? I'm not even sure that when that article was printed in the Christadelphian that perhaps the full significance of that little, that little piece of information was thought through. But Deuteronomy 28 says, The Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again with ships. By the way whereof I spake unto thee, thou shalt see it no more, and there ye shall be sold unto your enemies, and by ships and with ships for one last time. The Jews will be taken into captivity and we believe it will probably be off the coast of Palestina and therefore we expect a latter day Palestinian, well let's see what we do expect, what, what's our biblical expectation for the latter days? Well 
As we've said, we expect the increasing drive of independent Palestinian activity in the coastal region of the Gaza Strip. We expect the increasing tendency of the Palestinian movement in Gaza to foment a state of enmity with Israel. We see the increasing likelihood that Israel's security with at least the Gaza Palestinians will not come by peace, but possibly by some form of military control. And we see the increasing tension of the Palestinian conflict in Gaza as presaging the invasion of Gogan, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you why. Because those three quotations at the bottom, Obadiah 19, Joel 3, Isaiah 11, all passages we've looked at today suggesting a latter-day Palestina, but not only do they suggest a latter-day Palestina, those particular passages also suggest the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ because... Well, because Obadiah says that in that day, saviors will come up on Mount Zion. And Joel 3 says there'll be a voice that roars in Jerusalem. And Isaiah 11 says there'll be an ensign set up for the nations. They're all code words for the coming of Christ, aren't they, brothers and sisters? What a marvellous thing. As we see these things unfolding in the Middle East right now, we can have absolute confidence that Christ is near.